Now you know I'm, I'm still here. I missed you during the training, but that is the sovereign arrangement of God in his government. In 1998, I began to visit Russia twice a year to hold trainings for the Responsible Brothers. Then in 2002, while I was there, the co-workers approached me and asked if I would please consider having a meeting with their wives and other sisters. And the brothers sensed that the sisters needed just some particular fellowship. So that began a semi-annual aspect of my visit there. And what I'm going to describe now is the only way I've been fellowshipping with sisters in my whole church life. And it was this. The leading I had was to tell the sisters, this time is for you. It's not a time for me to give you a lengthy message. Rather, I'll give you a brief opening word on a matter that I think is significant for you. And then from that point on, please write out questions, pass them up to the front, and then there will be question and response. I don't say question and answer. Why? If a question concerns the truth, and the truth has been revealed and defined, then I can give an answer. And some of the sisters had serious questions about points of truth, so I answered. But most of their questions were experiential, they were practical, they were relational. And I don't have answers to things like that. I don't have answers to many of the deep questions in my own being. So I said, I will just give you, in response, genuine fellowship. Then you just weigh that with your discernment whether it's helpful or not. So we will have two sessions, 75 minutes each exactly. (laughs) Now until 1045, then a 15-minute break. In the first part, there's a reason you don't have an outline because this is not a message It was just some fellowship from my being. But the second session is for question and response. So I believe, Bob, before we take a break, we'll let you know how they can be submitted. If for some reason, almost semi-miraculous, there's no questions, (laughs) then I will earnestly seek the Lord what to do next. (laughs) But once the questions start coming, uh, there's quite a flow. And usually the length of a question and response meeting is at least two and a half hours. We'll have 75 minutes. Okay. Now the fellowship begins. So here is a description of what before the Lord and in the body I understand to be the intrinsic, essential function of sisters in the church life. And this function is to bring forth the all-inclusive Christ as life into the church. By God's creation, 
sisters are deeper than brothers for the most part. They're experiential by nature. And their capacity to love is immeasurable. This is by God's design. And yes, I'll comment later probably on outward practical service functions. But to have those without the essential function really means nothing. I repeat, the intrinsic essential function of a sister is to bring forth Christ as life into the church, into the body. This is not a matter of what sisters do. It's altogether a matter of what they are before the Lord. Right now as I'm standing here, I still sense affection and respectful love for two elderly sisters that were spiritual mothers to me. Only these two. One was Sister Lee, the other is someone you do not know. Their simple existence in the church, their presence in a meeting, brought forth Christ as life. This was a real, a, a real thing. And so this is where I focus. In 1968, Brother Lee gave some messages on um, the function of sisters. They're in Collected Works, 1968, Volume 1. And he mentions in the church, the body, The brothers are bones. I would add maybe muscles to be the structure, to be the strength. But the sisters are the blood, the life blood. And having said that, he pointed out that is why problems among the sisters are much more serious than problems among brothers. Because those problems affect the life blood, the life supply of the church organically. And he even said on one occasion, when he was a when he would become aware of this. He would fast and pray for days. And some of us who were here in 1977 and 1978 in Anaheim and passed through that valley of death, we know, we'll never forget how deep, how far-reaching was the damage caused by sisters who were out of order, who had no submission, and who were used by the enemy. So I present two extremes. Sisters that are spiritual mothers. Whenever I would meet them, just incidentally, on the sidewalk, just the smile, just the greeting, ministered life. I would just stop and receive whatever she wanted to say. But at the other hand, 
there is this side because both the Lord and the enemy want to use the sisters as vessels to accomplish their intention. So we cannot overestimate the importance, the function of sisters in the church as the body of Christ. But I come back to my original definition. This function is not a matter of how well you can do practical things. It depends entirely on what is taking place in your being year after year before the Lord. So I ask you now, not in the way of interrogating you, but of inquiring. When you are with the Lord, one-on-one with him, what is your basic prayer? What is most in your being? Are you able to say, Brother Ron, I realize what is on the Lord's heart is to constitute my whole being with himself as my life. This is his central work. And yes, I confess what I need to confess. I deal with things that I have to deal with. But my life before the Lord is the life of an open vessel to give the Lord unhindered access to every part of my being. Then now such a sister has a deep, hidden life with the Lord. Her life truly is hidden with Christ in God. And maybe 20% of what she experiences and what she has passed through might be shared. The rest directly flows through her being into the church. Now, with this as our point of reference, our foundational point. I want to share various matters related to this. And then toward the end of this session, and we'll end not by prophesying, but by by praying, I will point out to you the possibility of being in Christ what I will call a composite sister of three sisters in the New Testament. I'll mention them to you. The first couple you might be thinking of, the third might surprise you. Okay. If the sisters are to bring forth the all-inclusive Christ as life, They must have a being and a life of submission. Now, I don't know how this word is affecting you. Submission. I'm speaking to sisters, so I need to emphasize what submission is for sisters. If I'm speaking to brothers... There's another side of that. But it's important to make a distinction between submitting and submission. Submitting is a behavior. 
which mainly is from the natural life. It's mainly ethical. It's mainly giving in to what you're expected to do. Or it's a cultural reflex. This is the way your culture shaped you. Or it's dispositional. I'm not talking about this. Some kind of blind, undiscerning, submitting. Living and being in submission is an inward realization of our standing before God. And here, we need to see two aspects of the truth. And both should be equally stressed. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul points out that in Christ, three pairs of people no longer exist. In Christ, no Jews, no Gentiles. No one in bondage, no one free. No male and female. That's the word. Right now, there are a few brothers here, many sisters here, in Christ as a new creation. There is no male or female. And ultimately, when our whole being, when our body is transfigured, we will be fully in the new creation. We will all be glorified sons of God, This distinction no longer exists. But the situation is different in the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul mentions no Jew nor Greek, no bond or free. He doesn't mention no male or female. Because in practicality, The church life is in space, it's in time, it's in the physical realm, and we all are under God's governmental relationship concerning male and female. Being in Christ, where there is no male or female, does not nullify this other side. We all know Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion. Male and female, he created them. Here you see the equality. Male and female alike express God, represent God. But then in the next chapter, we see another aspect of how the female was brought forth. With this in view, we can look afresh at 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, and this word would be utterly hated (coughs) by our culture, (coughs) that the head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. This is a governmental relationship. And when a sister, she's not influenced by what she sees others wearing on their head or not, when she sees this vision, and realizes her standing and is aware that there is rebellion throughout this universe and rebellion throughout the earth, she with not only peace but joy 
would like to cover her head as a testimony to the rebellious angels. I maintain my standing. She knows she's not inferior. She's not a doormat for any man to mistreat her. This is what I mean by submission. It's not something any of us can do by our self-effort, by our natural life, by our determination. The one man who was fully obedient unto death is Christ Jesus. He is submission. We need him to be this within us. And then the sisters are, they have this combination now. They realize their essential function is to let life flow through them into the body. And then they also realize in order to carry out this function, my being and my living must be in submission. A further word to strengthen the point about life just flowing out of your being into the body. We owe this understanding to Brother Nee. And he gave messages on ministering life. And what he said, this is just inscribed on my being. He said, as soon as someone touches life in a fresh way, immediately that life flows through him into the body. Nothing needs to be spoken. Nothing needs to be done. And then what happened to him? For 20 years, this is how he lived. Only God knows how much life he touched, streamed through him into the body. But also, I would add, Brother Nee was dependent on the life supply in the body, so he's living in this mutuality. So any sister, for whatever reason, does not have submission in her being or in her living, no matter what she can do, like capable Martha. She is not a channel of life. And that is a great loss. That, I hope you would not misunderstand this, In the conversation Brother Lee had with me, he emphasized this. He said, sisters need to be hidden, to be covered. It doesn't mean you don't speak in a meeting. Sisters can prophesy. Sisters can pray. It means you're not here to express yourself in any way. You're not here to be recognized, to be appreciated. You are living the reality of the kingdom life in secret before the Father who sees in secret. And all that you do in the practical church life, that's like the trunk of a tree and the limbs is supported by 
deep roots. Now, based upon what we've covered so far, there's something that will be familiar to you, but I hope the familiarity wouldn't make this old. To me, it's very fresh. And let me introduce this way. I realize that as I'm aging physically, I will, under the Lord's leading, adjust my schedule of traveling and this and that. I have Brother Lee as a pattern. But I have been serving in this way for the last 25 years. And the basic reason I am able to do this is that sisters pray. They pray. Sisters that the co-workers have never met, they pray. And that prayer releases the life. I was once in a situation in another country <clears throat> that was physically threatening. So I called home. I knew immediately what my wife would do. She called Sister Lee. Sister Lee understood immediately. And the prayer dealt with it. The leading brothers, the elders, the co-workers set the direction, <coughs> make decisions, but the carrying out all depends on the prayers of the sisters. We can't match you in the prayer ministry. In Luke 18, the Lord tells a parable about persevering in prayer. He doesn't use a man. He uses a woman who is being persecuted by her adversary and appeals to the judge who is unrighteous and doesn't care, but she won't stop and the Lord said, you see what the unjudged said? But here is a sister that even when the heavens are silent and God appears to be nothing, has the faith to keep on praying. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being dramatic. I'm not appealing to your feelings. Without your prayers, I would not be alive today. I am fully dependent, learning as from Paul, at least a little bit, when he said, I know this will turn out to my salvation. Through your petition." and the bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so the prayer ministry of the church in, with your companion in a group, it's unlimited. One day I was working in my office in Building 2 on the campus, and a group of serving sisters, all experienced sisters, asked one of them to stop by my office with a question. And they said, we are facing a matter regarding a younger sister that is life or death. And the question was, can we pray prayers of warfare? And I told her without hesitation, yes, you are members of the body. 
But when you pray like this, you need to be covered. And we, the brothers, will cover you. So she went back and they prayed. And they delivered or enabled the Lord to deliver that sister. And the enemy was defeated. In Acts 12, persecution came not just from Judaism, the religion, but from the Roman leaders. Herod killed one of the apostles. Can you imagine the shock of hearing this? James, the brother of John, has been murdered. And Peter is in prison. And so the church prayed earnestly. So what happened? Well, an angel appeared twice. First to Peter in prison. Kind of poked him, said, wake up, we're getting out of here. The second time an angel appeared when Herod was glorifying himself and the people said the voice of a god. That angel came and struck him. Angels don't just fly around because they want to. Prayers reached the throne. And the throne realized this is not the way Peter will end his course. This is not the time. And so one angel releases Peter. Then I mentioned the other dealt with the oppressor. Then once Peter came to himself on the street, he said, this is not a dream. This really happened. Where did he go? And why did he go there? He went to Mary's house, the mother of John, where many were praying. And it's very likely, I followed Brother Lee in this, that there was mainly a group of sisters praying. You are able to release God's administration to be carried on the earth. You are able to open the heavens to pour out blessing. You are able to apply the victory of Christ to the present attacks of the enemy. The Lord cover me and you to say. But during the last couple of weeks, a brother with whom I can really open my being, I just let him know. I said, brother, I am under a constant attack of death from every direction. Well, as soon as a sister discerns this, the Lord just touches your intuition. Your prayers will deal with it. We cannot serve, we cannot travel, we cannot minister, we cannot work without you. But you're not going to get any credit for your prayers. We're not going to put up a plaque and say so-and-so is the so-called prayer warrior. The Father knows you will receive your reward when you stand before the Son of Man. And he says, I have a record here of your hidden life. Now, you will be manifested with me in glory.
But this prayer ministry is very closely related to a being and life of submission. If you are opinionated, if you are critical, if you are judgmental, just in your thinking, in your feeling, you're finished with this kind of prayer. If you are stumbled or bothered by something and can never let it go, you're not under submission. I'm talking about a condition of your inner being. You do not live by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You do not evaluate anything by right and wrong. You are in the stream of life. Okay, then the more we allow the Lord day by day to build himself into us, and the more we have a being in life of submission, then the prayer ministry emerges. For a brother to be brought into genuine ministry, beyond gift, beyond knowledge, genuine ministry, as we know from 2 Corinthians, is the issue of revelation plus suffering. There's no other way. The prayer ministry is even higher than this. In Acts, we're told the disciples said, Others will wait on tables. We will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now we go on to some other matters. And I alluded to this, so I bring it up now. It's something I truly do not understand. I do not understand it in anyone. And especially, I do not understand it with sisters. But I know a number of cases involving a sister who's the wife of an elder who was offended and for 20 years now, closer to 30 years, has never let the matter go. For some reason, has never forgiven this offense. I don't understand. Sisters, don't you know the kingdom truth? Your refusal to forgive will cost you the kingdom. So there is that side. But several times, and this is in a training context, sisters ask for fellowship. And they describe such and such a thing happened to me. I want to forgive, but I can't then I help them realize you need to understand something, what happened to you. You were not only offended, you were hurt. You were wounded. This happens among us. We just kind of collide. Dispositions collide. People say things. They have an attitude. And so I pointed out, you have the heart to forgive. You actually have forgiven. 
but you feel that you have not because the wound has not been healed. So you need to go to the Lord and open your being and let him pour into the wound oil and wine to heal you in life. When that happens, it will just be a distant memory, no more feeling. So there are a good number of sisters here. I'm not going to lay any requirement on you. I don't have an iron rod. I'm exercising. I will not give a commandment to you. But I would suggest something that may or may not apply to you. Just to be with the Lord and ask him, is there anything or anyone I need to forgive? Lord, I want to clear everything up. A little testimony. For many years, I was in a situation under my own Laban. This was of God. I needed this. And some really outrageous things happened and were said and done to many of us, including me. And I had to be before the Lord regarding this. And I realized this brother will never apologize. He will never repent. He just doesn't do that. But Lord, your word is, if I need to forgive something, I forgive whether or not he repents. So the Lord led me to pray. Then he added this. I said, Lord, since I have forgiven him, I ask you to forgive him and not to bring it up when he stands before you. I know what it is. I'm not a martyr, I'm not a hero. I'm just a brother. I know what would happen in 1978 and how deep it hurt me. And I made an inward decision because of certain things that were done. I will never open to anyone ever again. They'll betray me again. And after a meeting, an older brother, he's now with the Lord, I'd like to honor him. His name is Carl. He wasn't an elder then. He just went up to me like a father with a son and said, Ron, you have been hurt. And just his cherishing, his nourishing, enabled me to be healed and to nullify that self-protecting vow and to learn from the Lord how to open, when to open, how much. None of this is theory to me. Now the next thing, I have to use a word. It's a precious word, but it might, you know, I don't want, it might scare you a little. And I'm not hiding behind Brother Lee. I take responsibility for what I'm saying. But in one of those messages in the volume I told you about, in the context of Sister's Prayer Ministry, Brother Lee said, 
Sisters, you need to be broken. To be broken. A decisive act of the Spirit's discipline needs to touch the self. And when this happens, when there's the breakthrough, nothing can offend you. Things may hurt you, but they don't offend you. And now you're willing and able to sacrifice, to not defend yourself. Again, I'm speaking with sisters. The difference between sisters and brothers in this is not significant, but there is a difference. I'm quite aware of this, not deliberately. I don't scrutinize. I don't spy. I don't keep a mental record. But my dear sisters, there are actually very, very few sisters who are truly spiritually mature. And this is a desperate need to reach the minimal age of 20. We talked about this in the training. You are now fully in the fourth stage. But you have to pass through all the work of the cross on the flesh, the self, the natural constitution. And my heart is full of loving concern when I see a sister, maybe she's been here 50 years, maybe she's the wife of an elder or not, very faithful, attends all the feasts, attends all the meetings, engaged in practical service, then I realize standing in front of me is an unbroken shell. And one time, a number of us were having lunch with Brother Lee. He was always very careful in talking about situations. He talked about a certain brother who's an elder in a certain place and his wife. He just commented, she needs to be broken. Then what should you do when you hear this? I don't know if you want to reread part of that book, The Breaking of the Outer Man, but I don't suggest that. Rather, I suggest this, that you... Come to the Lord in faith and love and open your being to him and pray like this. Lord, I don't want to remain unbroken and untouched by the cross for the rest of my life. Lord, I'm willing for you to give me the experiences I need to be an empty yet broken vessel. Then when that breaking takes place, the limits that we've been placing on the Lord are gone. And now he can reach the depths of your being. If this does not happen, there will be two kinds of elderly sisters among us. And I'm not, I have no one in mind. Please don't be subjective. 
I'm not aiming this at you. I'm speaking in principle. Because they're elderly, regardless of their spiritual development, we respect them. We honor them. But we're not blind. We realize here's this sister. Like Sister Lee. And here is another sister. An opinionated older sister. The self is stronger now than when she was middle-aged. This is a very real situation. That's why Brother Lee had a training for us only for Anaheim and Huntington Beach in 1981 on the perfecting training. And the training was based on this question. Has your growth in life matched your years in the church? And he identified the causes. So these are matters related to the intrinsic, essential function of sisters to bring forth as life the all-inclusive Christ who has been and is being wrought into their being for the body. These sisters pray not only for their own spiritual development. They begin to pray like this. Yes, Lord, I want to be an overcomer. I want to be part of the bride. But Lord, now I'm praying for something higher than this. Gain me for the body. Grow in me for the church, for the saints. Do whatever you need to do to gain my whole being for this purpose. Now, we have 21 minutes. We'll need two or three to pray. I want to mention this composite, that is combination, sister of three uh, women, three sisters in the New Testament. And the first is Mary. The Mary, the sister of Martha. In Luke 10, Martha is very active. Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet, listening, listening. We need to realize listening is deeper than seeing. When the Lord himself is speaking to the seven churches, he said seven times, he who has an ear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So to listen requires that we are brought out of our subjectivity, our self-awareness, and we're just open to hear whatever the Lord would say. Then this same Mary, in John 12, broke the alabaster flask and anointed the Lord. Whenever there needs to be an illustration of absolute love for the Lord, it's not with a man, it's with a sister. 
She just, this sister realized something that the apostle brothers didn't. The Lord said, she anointed me ahead of time for my burial. She knew what was coming. And she grasped the opportunity to pour out from the depths of her being that hidden portion. Some have asked me, not very many, but a few, but why I wrote that line in the hymn, Love outpoured from hidden depths within me. What does that mean? It means something is accumulated in your being that is not for yourself. It's not for others. It's not for the church. It's for the Lord. So it's hidden even from you. But when it's time for you out of love to pour out your whole being to him, you discover there's something here, Lord, just for you. So you may want to consider, without being introspective, how your love for the Lord is developing according to the eight chapters in Song of Songs. Will we stay forever in chapter one? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Your love is better than wine. Don't we want to advance to a later chapter where the Lord says to her, your love is better than wine. Sisters, we can't match you. We can only learn of you. Follow the pattern of the depths of loving the Lord and pouring out your being on him. Then we have Martha. And I have some, I think, interesting things to share about Martha. But you have to listen all the way to the end. And I think you will be encouraged. In Luke 10, verse 38, we're told a a certain woman named Martha received him, the Lord, into her home. In verse 39, Mary sitting at his feet, listening to his word. But Martha was being drawn about with much serving. Now listen to this. She said, Lord, does it not matter to you that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to do her part with me. Now that is strong. That is super strong. Doesn't it matter to you? Tell her. Now, if it's an untransformed, prideful, Man, listening to this, I know from the Lord's own dealing, he would say, oh, you strong? Me stronger. I will never be defeated by a woman no matter how strong you are. Well, that's the old male flesh self pride. Listen to what the God man says. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Isn't this endearing? Martha, Martha, you're anxious, you're troubled. I'm a guest in your house. You want the food to be right. You want the table to be set. You're doing this all by yourself. 
But there is need of one thing, Martha. One thing. Martha's here. There are a good number. Wait till the end. You'll get the good news. Don't make up your mind yet. There's the need of one thing. In the church, there's a need of one thing among the sisters. It's not more activity, more doing. It's more sitting, listening, and loving. Mary has chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her. Then in John 11, Martha and Mary send a kind of coded message to the Lord Jesus concerning their brother Lazarus, who was sick. So they they appealed to his emotion. Lord, the one whom you love is sick. You love him. So surely we will come immediately and heal him. But the Lord, living God the Father, could not do this. And then we decided to come to show forth a sign signifying resurrection. The opinion started to flow, beginning with the brothers. Now you want to go, one of them says. This is dangerous. Another with a martyr self said, let's go and die with him. (laughs) Then he comes. Martha's there. If you had come, if you had come, our brother would not have died. It's your fault. And then he tries to tell her things. She says, yes, I believe something else. Then she goes and says, Mary, the Lord is calling you. He didn't call her. (laughs) Then Mary comes. Then eventually, Jesus wept. Now they're at the tomb. The Lord is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. He said, roll away the stone. Martha can't keep quiet. (laughs) She said, he's been in there four days. He stinks now. Ah. And so the Lord just declares Lazarus come forth and he's resurrected. Okay. You put together Martha in Luke 10 and Martha in John 11. To me, it's not very encouraging. So here is my assessment of the actual situation. Sisters, along with the other attributes I mentioned, have a keen awareness of practical needs, of human needs. We see this in Luke chapter 8. The Lord is traveling with the disciples, and a group of women are traveling with them ministering in a practical way, I believe with food, who knows, all kinds of human things. The sisters excel us in this. And Martha is superb at this. So we cannot have the church life without Martha. But Martha is so strong and opinionated, we cannot have the church life with Martha either. Okay. But, good news, John 12 follows John 11. And here we have a picture in miniature of the church life in resurrection. So the Lord is there as resurrection life. Lazarus is there. 
as a testimony of this. Mary is expressing her love. Then we read this. And Martha served. Martha served. This is Martha in resurrection. So those of you who are the Mary type, who've had certain grievances with the Martha type, don't give up on any of the Marthas. If you are aware of certain things in your thinking, in your praying, don't criticize. Just pray, Lord, bring our sister into resurrection. Because without this practical service, how can the church life go on? With so many needs, with so many people. And now, the third person, who could this be? Her name is Phoebe. And in Romans 16, Paul begins his greetings and fellowship concerning the churches. And listen to what he says. First, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a deaconess of the church, which is in Sancria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may have need of you. Now this is crucial. For she herself has also been the patroness of many of myself as well. So this sister was a deaconess. She's serving. But Paul emphasizes this. She's a patroness. So I looked this up in the life study afresh this morning. And a patroness is a person, this is a woman who comes alongside of you, who cares for you, who ministers to your needs, who cherishes you, who comforts you, and protects you. What kind of person is this? That Paul would even say, she was a patroness to me. I hope you don't have the thought that brothers who minister or brothers who are co-workers or brothers who are experienced elders like we have in Anaheim, that they don't need a patroness. We all need a patroness. And she herself, Paul is now caring for her in response, receive her, to honor her. Whatever need she has, take care of her. Then he explains why, on her part, she has been a patroness of many, of myself as well. So we put together Mary, Martha, Phoebe. Please don't consecrate yourself and say, Lord, from now on I promise to be a Martha, Mary, Mary, Martha, Phoebe. This is what the all-inclusive Christ as life wrought into a sister's being can produce. Yes, you will be a patroness in a way that matches 
the vessel God created you to be. But how much the church life would be elevated if in all the churches there were patronesses. This is just their being. It's an expression of her being. So there's the love that's developing to the uttermost. There's the practical service in resurrection. And there's the patroness, one who knows how to be with anyone alongside to supply, to provide, to cherish, to encourage, to comfort. I believe this fellowship, I truly believe, at least to some extent, it's from the Lord. And the sense I have is you are receiving it in a full way. And we just pray, Lord, work this out for the building up of the body, for the maturing of the new man, and the preparation of the bride. And so, we need to have some prayer. Let's have a number of sisters, wherever you are seated, just pray short prayers, two or three sentences. If we could have eight or ten pray, and then our brother Bob will direct us. Please don't hold back. Just let the Lord flow. How do you explain the matter of submission to a feminist? (laughs) Well, I don't think a feminist would be any more challenging than anyone else who has a strong concept, who is or is not open. I wouldn't try to convince a feminist, but if she has an open mind, then I would just share with her what this understanding is without any attempt to try to convince her and not to convey any feeling of judging her or labeling her or being threatened by her. If you want to know, I would tell you, if someone, their mind is closed, then I don't try to tell them anything. The Lord said, do not give what's holy to dogs or cast your pearls before swine. If someone is just on the verge of just counterattacking, then we, we just don't engage in that. Okay. okay. How do you go on when there is an older sister of stature who being offended and is hurt spreading death in the church life? And how do you shepherd younger sisters who are witnessing this? Well, this this does happen. Okay, I would, if you're aware of this, I'm speaking in principle, then surely you need to bring this to the overseers, to the elders. They need to know this kind of situation. And I believe they could guide you as to whether or not it would be beneficial to contact her about this. They may realize she's untouchable. But this is where the prayer ministry comes in. We are not passive when we are aware of death attacking in any way. If there's death in the prayer meeting, certain prayers should swallow it up and release life. But when you are praying concerning this, you're not praying against the sister. 
You're praying against the enemy behind the scene. But this should not be tolerated. Then with the younger sisters, to, to witness this, then again, you don't want to malign this older sister or speak disrespectfully, but you have to be honest that what you are getting is death. And we should always close ourselves to death, no matter from whom it's coming. Okay. Okay, this is why it's question and response, you will see here. I have a difficult situation with my husband after 30 years of being in the church life. He is so cold, and I don't trust, cannot be open to sisters or anyone to pray for us. What can I do? Well, if you have a genuine vital companion, and this I know from some experience, you can pray together regarding your husband without uncovering him. You just say that your your husband has a need and you pray positively. For the Lord be mercy on him, the Lord to come to him, the Lord to shepherd him. I believe you can pray like two or three gathered in the Lord's name in Matthew 18. And they were praying, the context indicates, about this person that wouldn't listen to one brother, wouldn't listen to a few brothers, wouldn't listen to the church, had to be treated like he's an unbeliever. Yet, this vital group was still burdened to pray concerning this. How can we carry out the vital groups according to Brother Lee's burden? I can't say much about this. I have some experience. It's not full. But the first thing, one thing I noticed when I returned to Anaheim in 1994, I saw in the church news this column under a heading Vital Groups. There might have been 20 or 25, and I wondered, not critically, just wondered, are these really vital groups or are they just group meetings? Then I noticed after time the heading changed to group meetings or home meetings. In order for a group to be vital, those participating need to be vital. Using the term doesn't make it different from what it is. So Brother Lee's definition of being vital is to be living and active in our spirit. Okay? Living and active. So those that are concerned either to have such a group or for a group to become vital then first, we should be before the Lord. To ask him to make real to us, being vital. I don't want to just use a term. I want to be living and active in my spirit. Some dear saints can be living, but they're not active. Part of being active is going to be caring for people, burden for people, a heart for people, praying for people, contacting people. So the vital groups 
on the one hand, are for the increase through the gospel and for shepherding and recovering others. Okay. Okay, you touched on the matter of healing, which is very helpful. But is there any way that we may hinder the Lord from healing us? Oh, definitely. And uh, my response here might be rather surprising. The self doesn't want to be healed. Because the self realizes when I've been hurt, I, am not, I now have power. And so, in having fellowship with brothers, I don't do this exactly anymore. I did this 20 years ago. I would tell them, I can save you 10 years in your married life. 20, I can't. 10, I can. How can I do that? Well, here is a list of really stupid things. If you do any one of them, your wife will be offended and hurt. And she will remember that. And she will remember the next one and the next one. And when you are having an argument, she will string them all together. And then she will say, you always do that. And how did I know about these list of stupid things is because I did them all. Okay. So with the Lord in John 5, remember this man by the pool? He asked him, do you want to get well? So the self can really be perverse in this way. We can pity ourselves, we can love ourselves, we can nurture ourselves. So we need to be willing And when we're willing, we will open to the Lord and ask him to pour in the oil and wine. And so it's the self that really kills our enjoyment, that hinders our experience. So we need to let go of this weapon that it's gone. You never bring it up again. It's not part of your being any longer. And let's say, one step further, if you find yourself resisting, then you have a backup prayer. Lord, be merciful to me and enable me to be willing. Many things we need to do, we're not able to do. We're not able to will. We're not lost. We can tell the Lord, Lord, I I need your supply, even to be willing to do this. And he will really take care of you in a precious way. Within the church life, I understand there's the practical separation between I'm not sure, this roles and function in life of brothers and sisters. However, I need more help on how this applies in certain ways in practice within the church life. Practically, for example, the practice of sisters not sitting in the front row, not participating uh, in breaking the bread, or baptizing new believers. Is this a matter of God's government within the church? Or sisters' uh, possibility, you know, doing the same? Okay. You just consider, uh, let's say we have, um, hey, when uh, you had the, Chinese-speaking conference in a few weeks. And a few thousand saints are together and have the Lord's table. 
and two sisters would come and break bread. Would you have peace about this? That I was in one meeting, a training meeting, decades ago, 4,000 saints. One sister went up to break the bread. And Brother Lee saw, saw her. He went up and told her to go back to her seat. It's just your inner senses, it's out of order. Whether or not a woman can baptize other women if there are no brothers around, I don't know. Personally, I wouldn't be bothered by it. But this is you know, part of the order. And let me give another example. Again, this is somewhat subjective. This is from my own view. Uh, I'm uncomfortable when sisters are overly active in directing a meeting. And some habitually do this. So let's just consider the matter of calling hymns. I would never say the sisters cannot call hymns. They should not call hymns. What ground do we have for this? But my observation is approximately 50% of the time the hymns are off. I've been in a meeting in my district here twice within several weeks. A sister called the first hymn, 132, at the Lord's table meeting. You don't begin the Lord's table with that. And so we should approach this organically by the sense of the body, the feeling of the body, rather than rules. This requires much more fellowship but I, I can't go further on this. Practical question with regard to head covering. Is it only for the church meetings and ministry meetings? Or should it include personal times of prayer and also gathering times with sisters that are not church meetings? Well, I don't know much about this. I'm not a sister. I don't wear a head covering. I believe, again, this is, there's no rule. There's no legality. You just go by the life in peace. Don't make it a law for yourself. I do remember an elderly, very mature sister in the Eldon Hall years, the wife of Samuel, of Brother Samuel, and her practice was to always wear it when she went to the Lord. But that's not something she taught or exemplified. It's just something she did. So just let the Lord live in you and you just live him out and don't be under any regulation, especially self-made regulations. If you have the sense to put it on, put it on. If it doesn't occur to you, you're praying with two or three sisters. Oh, no, I didn't cover my head. Don't let the enemy harass you. Tell him to go jump in the lake. You know which lake I mean, right? How do we deal with the need or desire to be appreciated and recognized? Okay, there are two levels here. Someone who has this need or this desire, there's not only the self. There is a human need. Something has happened in just the human life of that person to cause her to feel she's nothing, she's diminished, she's not appreciated. And she's not wanting to be glorified. She just would like some respect and recognition for her as a person, as a woman, as a sister. And so instead of our trying to figure out what percentage is self, what percentage is need, 
You just come to the Lord, and he's aware of both. And he can deal with both. If if the self is involved, then the cross has to be applied. But if there's a need here, and the need for you to be recovered, to have a proper sense about your worth before God, the shepherd of your soul will care for you in a most wonderful way. Okay. Okay, regarding our children who grow up in the church life. I have a burden for my son, who is senior in college, to consecrate his life to the Lord, two years full-time training. He wants to marry a sister before coming to the training. They met in the campus. Both love the Lord and in the church life. I don't know what is the Lord's leading. Okay. My response will be quite direct. But again, it's a response. But it will be direct. Uh, We parents have to know the limit set upon us by God concerning the extent to which we can go to direct the spiritual and human life of our sons and daughters. Our responsibility is to raise them humanly, to develop their character, to raise them under the law so they're brought to the Lord for real salvation, to provide for their human needs, to arrange for their education, to bring them to the Lord. But you're overstepping if you want to insert yourself with your view into what your son should do. This is something on the divine side is determined by God the Father and his will. On the human side, It's determined by two young adults. So we have, we know of situations where a brother is consecrated or a sister is consecrated to the training and a, a relationship that's proper starts to develop. Then they both feel, let's put this on hold. They have the grace to do it. Others have a very different leading. And they get married first. They take a year or so to establish their marriage. And they come as a married couple. We have a number like this. And I realize, I'm adding this point. In some cultures more than others, there's an emphasis on honoring your parents. Well, this is a command from God. We have to do this our whole life. But some have the cultural notion that to honor your parents means that no matter what your age is, you do whatever they want. And if you don't do whatever they want, they will accuse you of not honoring them. Well, this is in violation of God's arrangement. And so, yes, it's good you have the burden that your son would do this. But now I'm going one step further. Even in our having burdens for this, our self can be involved. That Yes, we want this to be for the Lord, but we want our daughter, our son, to be in the training. But if the opposite thing happens and they go into another direction, That affects us in a certain way. And so we should be open to the Lord, be honest with him about our feeling, and then honor him as having the supreme authority over this and respecting the decision of the brother and sister involved and be wise not to say and do things that could have a long-term effect on your relationship with them.
I think that qualifies as a response. Huh? What is the best way to fellowship with a sister who is terminally ill? Well, when you ask for the best, I, I don't know what's best. I assume the sister knows she's terminally ill. And depending on the depth of your experience and your capacity, I would suggest something like this. Why this has happened to you, why you're in this situation, we don't know. The only one who knows is God, and he's quiet, isn't he? But he's given you time to end your journey in victory, peace, and glory. And this should be in our heart toward someone like this. That one brother that was terminally ill, a brother who had caused many offenses to others, Someone who had been hurt by him and had left the recovery learned that this brother was dying. And he wrote him a very endearing letter just asking him, Brother, is there anything you want to clear up You know, before the end comes? So we don't delve into someone We don't probe into their life. But one definition of an overcomer is exemplified by Paul in 2 Timothy at the end. It is that an overcomer is a believer who finishes the course marked out by God. And so, Peter finished much earlier than John. It's not the length. It's finishing the course. And this is what would be in my heart. To pray for and even to pray with this one. And you sense any fear any issues with God, then you bring an atmosphere of cherishing where this one can be honest with the Lord and allow the Lord to touch them, care for them, so that the end in peace, in glory, and in victory. I know the principles of head covering and the Bible even shows the need of bearing it. But why do I feel that I'm falling into a ritual? Why do I have such a feeling and how can I overcome it? Um, Well, I, I don't know why you have the feeling. And I would approach it this way. Don't wear a head covering or do anything like that because this appears to be the culture among more spiritual sisters in the church or it's a practice. You should just go by the sense you have from the Lord. And if you feel you're doing this um, automatically as a legality, or as a ritual. Okay, this is just a thought now. I don't know how you'll feel about this. I'm not sure how I'll feel about it once I say it. Then you might want to experiment a little bit. To say, Lord, I don't know whether this is a ritual or not. So I'm not going to wear it. I'm not going to wear it. And just 
Consider in the Lord. Lord, how do you feel about it? Again, the Lord is the shepherd of your soul. He knows why you have this feeling. You open to him. He'll give you life and peace to wear it or not wear it. When to wear it and when not. What's the difference between being hurt and being offended? Okay. It is the self that's offended. Those that have been broken and have been, Brother Lee uses this expression, placed on the cross, the cro- uh, based on the altar mentioned in Genesis 35, the altar for the God of the house of God, for the building, and experience Christ as a burnt offering. The self is touched in such a way, nothing can offend her. Nothing. Brother Lee himself testified, nothing can offend me. All the factors of being offended have been touched. So it's the self that's offended. There may, the thing may be wrong, this and that, but it's the self. So you may not be hurt at all. I, I have known some sisters who've been offended where there was no offense. It was imaginary. This, this person is walking across the campus and, and didn't say hi to me. The person didn't even know you were there. And so there's no offense, but you got offended. And I was talking with a brother bearing responsibility with us at Living Stream, and he talked about this sister, this dear sister, got herself offended with every brother. But the wound is different. This means there's something as there's pain in your soul. You know, words, they're like a sharp sword. They pierce you, they hurt you, they damage you. And even if you're not offended, the hurt is there. And one effect of this is it kills your joy. The soul is the organ of enjoyment. Now your soul is suffering, so you cannot have joy. And so you may be offended without being wounded. Someone could be wounded without being offended. And some can be wounded and offended at the same time. Again, the Lord knows. I emphasize he's the shepherd of our soul. He's in our spirit as the pneumatic Christ overseeing us. He knows our situation moment by moment. He knows how to care for us. Just ask him. Can you share more on how to have a hidden life with the Lord? Okay. And this involves both times with the Lord one-on-one and your daily living. And so we have to learn that first we want to have experiences of the Lord through direct contact with him. Then the Lord, being our teacher, will train us if or when or what we've experienced can ever be shared. Brother Nee has a message on this. And he says, when you experience something, you enjoy something, immediately you just Talk about it. You just have the sense of emptiness. Like Hezekiah the king, who showed the representatives from Babylon, look at all the treasures that I have. And then the prophet said, what did you do? 
you'll lose all of it. So Paul, in 2 Corinthians, he mentioned a certain man in Christ 12 years ago. Whether in the body, out of the body, I don't know. He was carried away to the third heaven. He was carried away in paradise. He hid that experience within him for 12 years. But some of us, if we had a remarkable experience like that, we'd be on the phone, we would be texting, we would be prophesying about it. And that just makes us more shallow. And I learned, I'm still learning, I learned from the word, I learned from the ministry, and I learned especially from my mistakes. I learned very little from my rare successes. But once you made a certain mistake, oh, that, that just stays with you for a long time. And then one day, I was taking an early morning walk in Majeska Park when I lived in that area. And I had a conversation with the Lord. I said, Lord, I need to learn how to be with you person to person. To begin with, you can see me, but I can't see you. I need you, Lord, to teach me how to be with you. This is after I had been in the recovery for 30 years. I just told him, I I don't want to do anything formal, religious, I want to have real contact with you. So please train me. And he went about that. And another prayer I had while walking, I can share now. See, I'm bringing it out. I mentioned before that I can recall anyway. I just said, Lord, you see me, you understand me. Just care for me according to what you see and what you know. I don't know where I am. I don't know what I need. But you do. Okay? What is the best ways for sisters to study the word? Okay? It's no different from the ways with the brothers. Okay? No different. And so, I suggest these possibilities. One is, read the Bible through again and again and again. At whatever pace works for you in your actual situation. If you're a pneumatic mom with three children under the age of seven, Your schedule is going to be highly unpredictable. And so don't impose on yourself a law, but seek the Lord. What should my pace be? Then I would also recommend seeking the Lord about being in a particular book. I've done this many, many times. Again, following Brother Lee's pattern. And, and, and every time the Lord just gave me a sense. Ron, you need personally. This is not for you to give messages. It's not for you to prophesy. This is for you. You just pray, read through it. Spend some time in it. Then I would add this that we need the ministry to open the word. So we read the word, we recognize we need the ministry, the ministry opens, then we return to the word. And so for the long run, let's say a 10 10 or 20 year program, I recommend to saints who ask. One way to pursue the ministry is to go book by book. Another way is to go topic by topic. So as, again, the Lord knows where you are and what you need, uh, I don't think he will lead you 
to spend six months immersed in Ecclesiastes. But he might lead you to spend some time in Song of Songs. And um, I think this will happen when we, we fly tonight to Manila. We'll be there resting and then serving on the weekend. Then fly to Malaysia, resting, serving on the weekend. And I'll have a couple of meetings with the trainees. I think I'm going to walk them through Song of Songs in a certain way. And I would suggest to them that from now on, for the rest of your life, you read Song of Songs once a month. That's just the personal side of my own love story. The faith in and of the Lord the faith is of the Lord and not ourselves. However, can the Lord say to us that we have an evil heart of unbelief? Well he can say to this or indicate this if you have an evil heart of unbelief. But if you are afraid that you have an evil heart of unbelief, that's a strong indication you do not have an evil heart of unbelief. Because if you had an evil heart of unbelief, you wouldn't have that sense. You wouldn't have that questioning of yourself. Again, uh, I'm not exalting, I'm just honoring the sisters have a certain advantage over brothers. Just like, you know, it's common to say, in, you're in the car, your husband's driving, he doesn't know where he's going. She said, stop and ask for directions. No, I know where I'm going. The sisters can just admit, I don't know. I don't know about this. Oh, for a brother. Oh, a trained brother, an educated brother to say, I don't know. I don't know. And so you don't trust yourselves as much as brothers do. That's why the first thing you do is pray. Prayer is the last thing brothers do until they're dealt with. It's the first thing you do. And so the sister who wrote this, I have the some... Confidence to say, you don't have such a heart, but you may also want to pray a preemptive prayer. Lord, grant me the mercy never to have an evil heart of unbelief. Give me the spirit of Caleb. Okay? And he will. I'm going to get through all of these. (laughs) How do we know when we are ready to receive a harsh dealing from the Lord? And how do we receive them without becoming bitter? Is it all the Lord's mercy? I am a 20-something sister. Okay. Um, You don't know. You don't need to know. Consider Jacob. Okay? He's going back home. He hears his brother is coming with him. With what? 200 men. So he's terrified. So then he has this arrangement. I will divide my family in half, put my favorites behind. And then that night... The Lord, as an angel, comes and wrestles with him all night. Quite a match, because he was so strong. He had to expose to Jacob his strength. And then he touched the core of his strength. But the Lord didn't say, Oh, Jacob, uh, in a couple weeks, we're going to have a wrestling match, and I'm going to touch you. You don't need to know. You don't need to know. He will know when it happens. 
And when it happens, you will realize it. And so I didn't know. But late at night, July 30th, 1981, the Lord came to me in a certain way that he never did before or later. And then he and I knew this was him. I had a concept of what it is to be touched in this way. The concept was completely off. And I just worship him and adore him and praise him for this. So when he comes and does this, the grace and the mercy come with it. I was not able to, according to the Lord's arrangement, really release the intrinsic burden concerning God's government. But I have learned from First Peter and from the ministry that when God's governmental hand is on us and we humble ourselves, the grace is there immediately. They're not separated. For his supply is always there. And that is what keeps us from being bitter. We're bitter, not about this kind of dealing, but about things that happen that are contrary to our assumptions, our expectations, our self. So that's not, you could say, a direct dealing. It may be indirect. But if you sense this is, you're capable of being bitter, this is a mercy then just settle it right now. you 20-something. You settle it right now with one prayer. You say, Lord, please give me this mercy that whatever discipline I'm under of the Holy Spirit, whatever dealings, I would never be bitter against you. Okay, that's it. This is a preemptive prayer. And the Lord will take care of you. So a 20-something sister asked such a question. And so, sister, whoever you are, I'm not going to try to guess. I don't want you to reveal yourself. If you're asking this kind of question now, by the time you are 34, you will be well into the fourth stage of the experience of life. Okay. Does a divorced woman or sister should pray to have a better marriage again? Yes, yes, amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I'm glad you said better, not just any. You know what it's like when it has that kind of ending. So this this is a human longing. You were married once. This is what happened. You're still a woman. You still have the longing. You still have the need. You don't have to be ashamed of that. That's what's in your heart. And the one when we pray in the prayer meeting, prayers of God's administration, His government, prayers of warfare. We need to know his will and respond to his will. But according to Philippians 4, in our situation, Paul says, don't be anxious. Make all your requests known. Don't hold them back. Lord, I want to be married again. I want to have a new beginning. But then, I add this. Please, Follow the principles God has ordained regarding remarriage. We have known many, many situations of a brother whose wife abandoned him, a sister whose husband left her. They got a divorce that they didn't want. 
But they realized in order to remarry, they need the ground to remarry. And that is your spouse passed away or has joined himself or herself to another, in a sense, married to someone else. So then you can do it. And there's just so many cases where the sister or the brother waited on the Lord for for the ground to be opened. And in every case, there was tremendous blessing. The Lord brought a mate. The match was just perfect. And they're in a realm like they never thought possible. But some do not follow this. They violate this. I know some situations, personally, I had to be faithful in the fellowship to say, you do not have the ground to remarry. But human beings are free. They're not robots. They did it. But there'll be no blessing. But surely, back to the question. Yes, pray whenever it comes up in your heart. Talk to the Lord about it. If you've already done it 280 times, then do it it 281 times. This is your living before him. I had a deep and sweet relationship with the Lord before I met my husband. But since my marriage and having a family, my heart for the Lord has not been the same. It has been almost 20 years, and I don't feel I can find the Lord or touch him or love him in the same way no matter how much I try. Why? Because you're at a different stage. The Lord doesn't want to bring you back to that particular stage of your love relationship with him. And this is seen in Song of Songs, chapter 2, where the lover of the Lord has, has this supreme enjoyment, the house of wine, so much love, enjoyment of the Lord, mutual love. Then he comes, leaping and skipping, saying, my love, come away, come away. She can't move. She doesn't move because she's there examining, introspecting her situation, taking that as the criterion. That's it. I've already been at the peak Well, all that you've passed through in your married life with your children, you may not be aware of it, but much ground has been gained in you, I believe. And the Lord doesn't want to bring you back to spiritual pre-adolescence. He wants to bring you on. And so eventually, the Lord comes in a way she never knew him before, leaping and skipping. And he tells her the winter's over, the birds are singing, the flowers are blossoming. And then a few verses later, oh, my love, you're in the cleft of the rock. How beautiful is your countenance, how pleasant is your voice. So eventually, she got there. Then in chapter 3, she's a pillar. Then in chapter 5, the Lord comes again to call her further. The response is delayed, but eventually she's brought on. So sister, ask the Lord to release you from being governed and directed by the past. And believe me, the Lord wants to bring you 
into a relationship with him more wonderful, more enjoyable, more delightful, with more reality than anything you ever dreamed or imagined happening. He's going to bring you all the way until you're a Shulamite. You are as beautiful as Tirzah, lovely as Jerusalem, terrifying army to the enemy. You will be his co-worker, serving him by love and expressing love in your service. Then you'll reach chapter 8 and say, Lord, if I see you outside, I would kiss you. I want to be raptured. I want you to come back. This is your future. We have to learn of Paul forgetting the things which are behind, including precious spiritual experiences. When we see a practical need with husband or for a saint or when there are calls to come to serve or help, how do we know when to pack it up and when not to? Okay. We have to learn when to say yes and when to say no. That some, they feel guilty in a religious way of someone is asking you, to, will you help with this? Will you serve in this? She's fully aware. She's already at capacity. But she's just afraid to say, no, I can't do it. And the enemy harasses her. And so then you get overextended and the Lord shows you that only you and I know your present capacity. Someone comes, they're asking you to do this. Only God is omniscient. They don't know what your situation is. And so you need to be honest and say, I'm not able to do this. Like I receive again and again invitations to travel to this country or that country. And I have one I need to respond to from a country I've never visited in in Asia. And I realize before the Lord, I cannot make that trip. I cannot fly from L.A. to that country just for this. I can only visit if I'm already planning to be for a period of time in that area. So I'm not going to be afraid of saying I'm not able to do this. Okay? And then maybe they'll get a brother 15, 20 years younger who has the energy to do this. To me it would be unwise physically, spiritually, psychologically, relationally to the most important person to just try to be a good guy and not say no. So this we have to learn under the Lord's shepherding. And again, just ask him to guide you in in this matter. Okay, are we broken once and for all? Or do we need to be broken constantly? Okay, 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 it's not constant. The, The actual situation experientially is this. Okay, with let's take Jacob again, there's the decisive breaking. And that caused the Lord to say, your name now is Israel. But that wasn't the reality. So he needed some supplementary breaking experiences. They're not constant. They're spaced out and overall they're rare. It's not a daily thing. 
And there'll be a lie from the enemy. And so, certain things happened to his daughter. Then two of his sons got revenge and killed the perpetrators and then put Jacob in a difficult situation. Then eventually, the Lord brings him to Bethel and he offers the sacrifice to El Bethel, God of the house of God. Now he knows God in a corporate way, not just personally. Then what happened after that? Rachel is in childbirth. And he is right there. And the helper says to Rachel, you will have this child also. But she knew she was dying. So the baby came. She named him Benoni, son of sorrow. Jacob is right there, seeing the love of his life pass away. Then he said, no, I name him Benjamin, son of my right hand. Then he saw her breathe her last. Surely, for any human, this is a breaking. It's deep, but it's not the decisive one. Then he buried her, set up a pillar, and journeyed on. But he wasn't mature yet. And so we know what happened with Joseph. Another breaking. They're always measured out by God. He's an expert at this. There's always the supply. And there's nothing we need to fear. It's because we have the aspiration to go on that the enemy may attack us to instill fear. Don't take his thoughts. Put on the helmet of the hope of salvation, the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Hide under the shield of faith. And I'll tell the enemy, don't you dare attack any of my sisters. We will smash you to nothing. We're not going to let this happen to ourselves or anyone else. We hear so much about the need of consecration. However, we also hear that we need times when people have had deep consecrations to the Lord. Something tragic happened in their life. So we fear to consecrate. And then we also Fear that things may happen to any way, whether you consecrate or not. So then, what is the point of consecration? And the difference does it make whether we consecrate or not? I appreciate this question. And I mentioned this to young people more than once. Okay? Human life is a life of suffering. And because we're living in the old creation, we're not exempt from the kinds of suffering that can happen to anyone alive on the earth. Now, consecration. Consecration is not a vow. It's not a promise. It is a decision. And the decision is, Lord, I present myself to you as a living sacrifice. I give you the permission to work on me, to work in me, to work through me, and to direct my steps. The Lord will honor this decision of our will. Then he will give us, as he did with Jacob, as he did with Paul, with Brother Nee, with Brother Lee, And many of us, he will give us all kinds of experiences that we might not have had if we hadn't consecrated. But those experiences 
are under God's sovereign hand. They are very productive spiritually. They enable Christ to grow in us. And so I've I've talked to the trainees or the young people. You may have the thought, if I consecrate myself to the Lord, uh uh-oh, I will have difficult experiences. And I will say, that is right. But if you do not consecrate yourself to the Lord, because human life is a life of suffering, you will have difficult experiences. So don't think you can avoid suffering by avoiding consecration. Now, the core of this question. Right now, as we are here, people all over are suffering great loss. The loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of their health, the loss of their finances. And it's just a suffering with no benefit at all for God or that person. It's a meaningless suffering. Their life is meaningless, purposeless, aimless. And if they are thoughtful, I passed through this phase when I was young. Life is absurd. It's meaningless. And this is still my view. I either have a life full of purpose and meaning to carry out God's perfect will for his heart's desire, or the whole thing is a joke. It's absurd. But when you consecrate those things that happen, that also are happening to unconsecrated people, are under God's direction. And eventually, I say this inwardly with a smile, you will offer him retroactive amens and belated hallelujahs. Many of us have done this. You reflect upon this, you see what the Lord gained. They say, Lord, now I thank you for this. I say amen for this. I praise you for this. Then you might add a P.S. Don't let this happen again. (laughs) And then the Lord, in a friendly way, he may say, no, that won't happen again. Other things may happen. When they do, you will be ready, and I will be there. And eventually, when you finish your course, in victory, or are raptured as a first fruit, which is our living hope, you will look back on your whole life in the Feast of Tabernacles and praise me with your whole being that you led me this way. Now the last question. I hate my disposition and I know I can't change it. I feel so stuck with it. However, I know the Lord created me with it. What can I do so that I won't live in such a miserable way, stuck with my ugly disposition? I get the impression she really doesn't like her disposition. Okay, in the last two or three minutes, uh, I'm somewhat familiar with this. So I'll tell you a little story. I think about 1975, Brother Lee gave a series of messages on dealing with the disposition in some service meetings in Anaheim. And even he said, oh, you need to come together in a group and ask others to touch your disposition. Then later he said, don't do this. This is dangerous. But the Lord put in me a desperation concerning my disposition. Just a desperation. I didn't waste a lot of time condemning it, deriding it. I just realized this is the depths of my being. This is the depths of the self. This is going to swallow me up. I I took in the word. I ate it. I consumed it. And then one day, this was in Irving, Texas, I went to the health club because I 
believe in having a program of exercise for health. And I was doing lap swimming in a big pool. And I could swim freestyle okay, but I never learned how to turn. So I got to the end of the pool, and I stood there, catching my breath to go on. And then a living word came to me. Shall the thing formed say to the one who formed it, why have you made me thus? Because I was holding the Lord responsible. I said, this is not fair. I had nothing to do with this disposition. I was born with it. I was created with it. And now you're holding me responsible for it. And I'm trapped in it. And the Lord bore this for a while. And then he said, the potter has authority over the clay. So that released me. And then I can say this, under the Lord's covering and to his glory, he is here. I speak to him face to face. He is here. Lord, you gave me the experiences that I need to save me from my disposition and even to bring the God-created part of my disposition into resurrection for the body of Christ. And my sisters, if the Lord can do this in me, he can do this in anyone. And so just... Ask, just tell the Lord, I give you the room and the ground to give me the experiences that I need. And I assure you, you will be able to bear the same testimony. He will not let this go unfinished. God always finishes what he, what he starts. He's thorough. He's relentless. He's determined. Praise the Lord for such a God. So just pray to him and trust he will get through. He will go to the depths of your being. One day, I was driving home for lunch from serving and something mysterious occurred to me from 1 Peter 3. Christ's spirit was enlivened on the cross. And when he died, he descended into the abyss and proclaimed his victory to the evil angels that were bound there. And he declared his victory over their leader, Satan. Then I realized the Christ who descended into the abyss and proclaimed his victory, this Christ lives in me. And I realize myself, my soul, I'm not a shallow person. I'm not as deep as the sisters, but I'm not a shallow person. My soul is an abyss, but you will descend to the bottom of my being and declare your victory. And he did, sisters. This is our God. Praise him. So why don't we end by just praying with someone nearby? Okay, just if you don't want to do it, just sit there and enjoy the Lord. Just offer something to the Lord. We did it. It's 1218. We almost kept the time. I just want to add one thing. From the Lord through me to you. May the Lord bless you. In every way. At every time. Everywhere and in every situation for the rest of your life Amen. until we all meet the Lord in glory. Amen, amen and amen. amen. So please pray. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. 
Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.